Growing up at our family seders, my uncle would always assign us kids' roles in the Magid section. I must have had a different role each year because honestly, I don't remember which roles I had, but one role was the same every year. My cousin Jason always played Moses. And every year when the time came, my cousin Jason had to stand up, raise his arms way up in the air to part the Red Sea so that the Israelites could cross through on dry land. And being a kid, this wasn't his favorite position, so his arms would sink back down. And my uncle would chide him lovingly, Jason, Moses, get those arms back in the air. The Israelites have to cross the Red Sea. <laughs> and he wasn't allowed to bring them back down until all the Israelites had crossed the sea and the Egyptians were pursuing them. My uncle, by adding Moses into the Haggadah, was fixing what he saw as an apparent mistake. The absence, the hiddenness of Moses from the Passover story. The rabbis who created the Haggadah were concerned about the rise of Christianity. So they made sure that the Haggadah taught that not an angel, nor a messenger, nor a human being was responsible for our freedom from Egypt, but God and God alone. I have a confession to make. My Facebook profile is not an accurate reflection of my day-to-day -day life. <laughs> Rather, it's a compromise between my parents' admonition not to brag and my feeling that if you really knew the state of my house, my car, my finances, and the fight my son and I just had before I posted the most adorable picture of him on my wall, <laughs> you would unfriend me. And I walk a fine line between what I choose to reveal and what I don't. Funny thing happens when you hide. The world lets you hide. In fact, the world actually encourages you to hide. How many of us have hidden by not being able to be heard, by not being listened to, being hidden by other people? I also hid somewhere else. My first day at Cornell University, I am in physics class for physics majors. You know, I'm, I'm really top of the class here. I took my AP Physics, I took my AP Calculus, and here I was, I arrived. I wasn't sure I wanted to be a physics major, but that's where I was. The professor comes in, he tells us what the prerequisites of the course are, whether we knew this derivative or that derivative, whether we knew integrals, and I raised my hand along with all the other students. I knew that. Yes, I knew series, I knew that. And then he came over to me individually, singled me out, and he said, where did you learn X, Y, and Z? How do you know this? And it only was at that moment that I realized that I was the only woman in that classroom. And I was scared, I was singled out, I was exposed, and I chose to hide. At the end of that class, I dropped it and went to regular first year physics to take it again for another year in a row, rather than be exposed in that class. Sometimes we hide because we're afraid. Hiding keeps us safe. How many of us have big, audacious dreams that we talk about all the time, but we never start? Because by starting, we might fail. And then sometimes I hide because I have something to hide. I imagine that I knew I was gay when I was around 12 or 13. I had a friend in high school accuse me of having a crush on her brother, her twin brother. And though I adored her twin brother, the truth is I had a crush on her. And boy, I didn't want to. So I buried it down, I hid it, and hoped it would go away. 20 years later, 20 years, I finally came out to myself. At the time, I was serving as the cantor of a large conservative congregation in Silicon Valley. And at the end of my contract, I left the pulpit. When I came out to my parents, my father pulled me aside that night and he said to me, you know, you're not going to march in any parades or anything like that. The world conspires to keep us hidden. 
When Jacob blessed his grandchildren, Ephraim and Manasseh, he says to them, May you grow in multitudes like fish throughout the land. Why fish, the rabbis ask? Because fish multiply underwater, hidden from view. It's precisely their hiddenness that protects them from the evil eye and fulfills the Talmudic dictum that blessings rest only on something hidden from view. How could hiding, how could hiding that I'm gay be a blessing? On the contrary, let me tell you what hiding does. Hiding fractionates you from who you are and who you portray yourself to be. Hiding isolates yourself. By isolating yourself, you confirm to yourself that you're less than, that you're not as good as. And hiding does a disservice to those who are struggling with the same or similar issues. When you divide yourself, you are no longer shalem, whole, and you never can experience shalom, peace, and experience that oneness with our creator. There is a story told in the 1700s by the Magid of Dubnov. And he talks about this king who has the best of everything. He's got among his many possessions, the most glorious diamond. And he loved his diamond so much, he would take his diamond out every day and just stare at its beauty and its brilliance. And one day he takes the diamond out and sees this very large scratch in it. And he's horrified. And he calls all the diamond cutters in the land to come fix his diamond. But none of them can do it because they're afraid they might ruin the stone. All but one diamond cutter. This diamond cutter says, I can fix it, but it will take two weeks. And you can't talk to me during those two weeks, but I will come back with a repaired stone. So at the end of two weeks, he comes back with his stone. And where there was that deep scratch, he had engraved a beautiful rose. The flaw that was in the stone had become its most beautiful attribute. It reminds me of that line in Hallel, that the stone that we cast aside, that the builders cast aside, becomes the cornerstone. When we hide, we cast ourselves in the shadows and we say, God's light, don't look here. We don't want God's light to appear here. And when we reveal ourselves, when we unhide, we allow God's light to appear everywhere. It's like the line in Leonard Cohen's song. Forget your perfect offerings. There's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. When I look for role models of hiddenness in our Jewish text, I gravitate, of course, to Esther, whose very name connotes hiddenness. Esther marries the king of Persia, but she doesn't tell him that she's a Jew. She hides that. And then she learns that the Jews are slated to be destroyed. So she has to make a choice. If she comes before the king unsummoned, she could be put to death. If she tells the king that he married a Jew, she could be put to death. If she says nothing, the Jews will be put to death, and maybe that would include her too. So she may have asked for God to come in and fix the problem. She may have wanted a burning bush to to appear and tell her what to do, but she doesn't get any of those things. So what does she do? She has to depend on herself and she has to have the strength to reveal herself, to come out to the king. So she and her maidens and the Jews of Shushan fast for three days. And at the end of the three days, she dons the most magnificent robes and she comes before the king. And the king welcomes her and says, Esther, up to half of my kingdom I'll give you. Esther hides herself before the king and even though that was difficult, it saved the Jews of Persia from annihilation. Similarly, Moses is living in hiding. Moses is in Midian, living a comfortable, idyllic pastoral life as a shepherd. And he's married to Zipporah. His life is great. He could retire this way. But God comes to Moses and says, no, you have to go back and you have to reveal yourself. You have to unhide yourself to Pharaoh and say, let my people go. And though Moses doesn't want to do it, he does do it. And Pharaoh says no. 
And Pharaoh says no 10 times. And even after he lets the Israelites go into the desert to worship their God, the Egyptians pursue them to the sea. Because coming out, unhiding yourself, isn't easy. And it's not one and done. It's a daily choice, a daily action against innumerable pharaohs. But it's that daily choice, that daily action that turned a shepherd into the greatest leader of the Jewish people. And it's that daily choice, that daily action that turns an orphan girl into the queen of Persia and the savior of the Jewish people. And it's that daily choice that turns you and me to achieve our greatness. To be honest, I still hide. If I'm talking to someone who's really not listening to me, I don't reveal myself. And that's a mistake, because it's not about them. It's about me. And the more we, all of us, present ourselves who we really are, the more we live in shalom, completeness, and shalom, peace. And we also can help those who cannot unhide themselves. As a school teacher, I know this. I see those students who are hidden. We can go to people who are hidden and provide a sounding board in a place where they can unhide themselves and reveal themselves, a safe, non-judgmental place. Going back to my uncle in the Seder, I understand why he put Moses in it, because of course, Moses was an integral part of our Passover Seder. But I agree with the rabbis. Moses didn't belong in our Seder. For the same reason Moses was taken out of the Seder and God was taken out of the book of Esther, why are our our main characters missing from these important Jewish texts. Because I think what Judaism teaches us is that we need to place ourselves in each of those stories so that we, you and I, by unhiding ourselves, we gain our own freedom. Thank you. <laughs>